exam, because your exams are on Tuesday, I think, right? So you guys should have to study and come prepared to ask me questions, and I'll work through the types of problems that will be on the exam. So Thursday is more of like a giant sort of discussion session with us now implementing or using all the material that we've been talking about so far in the course. So, so that's how that's going to work. We're good? So, but you should come prepared. Otherwise, if I say, what questions do you guys have? And if there's silence, then we're kind of wasting their time. Okay. Any questions or comments from last time? No? All right, so the HPT, a couple questions, some people emailed me. Remember, TRH works through that new G protein we talked about, the gene alpha Q. And TRH is primarily stimulated based on that second message system. The release of TSH that's already been transcribed and translated and stored in the cell, right? So TRH is working through that G alpha Q process that we talked about. That's primarily causing the release of stored TSH. There's probably other mechanisms through PKC and through the calcium-dependent protein kinases that lead to changes in transcription and ultimately translation, but it's thought that the fastest thing that's happening with TRH is the release of stored stuff through that cascade that brings calcium into the cell. And I'm trying to find another copy of that video that I used to have that shows the role of calcium in causing vesicle binding and exocytosis. But calcium is critical for that, both in neurons as well as in, in, in the pituitary. Uh, and pituitary release of, in this case, glycoprotein is stored in the vesicle. So then we talked about how the thyroid gland itself is made up of a bunch of follicles. I use jelly donut because they remind me of jelly donut. So it's literally like spherical, three-dimensional spherical follicles. And if you slice them in half, of course, it looks like slicing a jelly donut. When the dough in the jelly donut would be made out of cells, it's a single cell layer. And the middle, or the jelly, is this colloid. That's acellular. Okay? And some people are confused about this. What I was drawing on the board is what if I took a section? section of the thyroid gland like that, and we talked about on this board what's happening in this follicular cell versus what's happening in the colon. Is that clear how the, how the structure is? So on this board, I talked about this as being the follicle cell, so this being one of these cells, and on this board, this is the colloid. So this is in the jelly of the donut. Good? So the processes happening in this cell where one, the follicle cells concentrate iodine. I should, I'm sorry, I need to bring a box of salt. But if you've ever used Morton salt, let's see. It says iodide salt contains iodide and important nutrient or something like that. Got it. That's one of the things that's helped us get rid of the problems with borders in certain regions of the world, is that it's now added to the salt, so it's added to your diet. The follicle cell collects iodide, by using this symport, it's not, as your book says, it's not a pump that requires ATP. It uses the sodium gradient to bring iodide into the cell. Now, ATP might be used on the other side of the cell, on the ACO side, because there's a sodium ATPase that maintains that gradient. So there's no ATP being burned to bring iodide into the cell. And then we talked about this peroxide generating system, which as far as I know is unique to the thyroid gland.
And then the peroxide is being generated to organify. And I admittedly told you I have no idea what that means. Somebody says it's taking away an electron. Anyway, don't quote me on that. I don't know. I don't know what it means. I've looked it up for years. I don't know what organifying means. But this system is important. The iodide is not reactive without this situation in the cell. And then somebody was confused and asked, well, where's the iodide coming from? The iodide then, so this is a cell membrane on the apical side. So this is the membrane that's here. The iodide is then moved down its gradient into the colloid. So the iodide is brought in through the sodium iodide sip port. It's organified by this peroxide generating system, whatever that means. And then it leaks down its gradient into the colloid. The other thing that's happening in the cell is that you're generating, transcribing, and translating. This thyroglobulin, which is a big protein that has a lot of tyrosine residues on it. It's not all tyrosine, but it has a lot of tyrosine residues. And these tyrosines. through some enzyme, are iodinated because now the organified iodide is added to the side groups on the tyrosine. The sum of the side groups are broken off and attacked the epithelium. being assembled on this glycoprotein. And then it's unclear where it happens. There may be an enzyme that cleaves off the individual G4s in the colloid, but I think most studies suggest that the thyroglobulin is taken back up and digested in the cell to generate the T4s. And then it's released on the other side. generates a free radical, which is probably why this happens in the colloid rather than inside the cell. This is probably why this is happening in the jug. Ignore this board. Apparently it's stuck. Circulates in your body is T4. 
tetraiodothyronine, or thyroxine. It's all the same thing. It circulates bound to one of three proteins. Albumin is this protein in your blood that's involved in things like maintaining optimal regulatory balance. But it's also what's called a low affinity high capacity binding protein. Low affinity high capacity. So a lot of things can stick to albumin, but not very well. So some thyroid hormones, some steroids, a bunch of other stuff in the blood kind of sticks to albumin. Low affinity high capacity. So many binding sites. <coughs> But then there's one called transthyretin. Which people call TTR. It also used to be called pre-albumin because it migrated on the gel before albumin. It used to be called pre-albumin. Transthyretin is another portmanteau. I just use that word whenever I get the opportunity. It stands for transporter of thyroid and retinol. So it also transports retinol. Transporter of thyroid hormone and retinol. But then there's one called thyroid hormone binding globule. By the liver. It's at the lowest concentration in the blood, but it carries the most thyroid hormone because it has the highest affinity. So most of the thyroid hormone is carried by this TBG, which I think is in the same family as CBG, the related proteins. Because it's a single, there's one protein per thyroid hormone, I think the same is true for TTR, but it has the highest affinity. So even though albumin is like bus, right? You can carry a whole bunch of them. Because TBG is like a, I don't know, a taxi that only has one seat in it, but it has the highest affinity. So most of the thyroid hormones are the TBG. <coughs> yeah. No. Yeah. yeah. So the binding proteins come from the liver, and it's just in circulation. In fact, most of the binding protein, I think, is it's unbound. So it's around in the blood looking for thyroid hormone to bind. The thyroid hormone is coming out of the thyroid gland, whereas the binding protein, the TBG anyway, is coming from the liver. TTR, I think, comes from the, it's in the cerebral spinal fluid and or plexus, don't worry about that. Yeah, I forget your name, what's your name? Jerry? Okay. Ha, ha, I did not forget your name. Um, so, how, when would you find T3? Okay, that's like, where we go. So T3 is produced primarily in the target tissue. So this is T4. T3, or triiodothyronine, sorry, this, this board doesn't work great. T3 is when this iodide is removed. And it's removed by an enzyme called monodeiodinase. There's a whole bunch of monodeiodinases, in fact, I think there's four that remove different iodides. So there's something called reverse T3, for example. If you take the top iodide off on the right, then that's an inactive compound. As you remove more iodides, the T2 and T1 and T0, those compounds are inactive. That's how that hormone is degraded. So most tissues where thyroid hormone is a target, have this monodeiodinase and convert the T4 to T3. 
So if we people ask you questions about which one's the real hormone. So it turns out, as we'll talk about on Tuesday, we're going to test. We're good today. No, we're good. Okay. As we'll talk about on Tuesday, both T4 and T3 bind the receptor. But T3 is better. I'll show you how we know that on Tuesday. T3 has a higher affinity, it's better at binding the receptor. T4, a lot of T4 will do the same thing as a little bit of T3. But most of what happens is through T3 because most of the target tissues have to model the IMA. So the T4 never makes it into the nucleus. It gets into the cytoplasm and then it's converted to T3. Yes, what's your name? Green. Green, what up? Is it T3 ever in circulation? There is T3 in circulation, right? Because it's, it's not necessarily degraded in the target tissues. So you will find it in circulation, but most of us circulate in T3. So there will be, and in fact, this cell isn't perfect, right? So some, some T3 is actually coming out of the thyroid gland. Some T2, some T1. If you don't have any iodine, T0 is coming out. So some's even coming out of the thyroid gland because this isn't perfect. It doesn't completely iodinate everything. But you will also have some in circulation that's potentially been converted into targets. Yeah, okay. Lee, Lee. Did you say that uh, some other iodides get removed instead of the bottom So some tissues, for example, uh, you do something called reverse T3, where you take the wrong iodide off, and that actually deactivates it. So if you're not a target for thyroid hormone, and this may be important, sorry, I know we're talking about humans, but this may be very important and tactful to protect some tissues from metamorphosis too quickly, is you make this into the reverse compound, which doesn't work. Or you continue taking iodides off until, you know, T2 is not active, T1, anything other than T4, T, the T3 has to is not an active compound. So it's both a way of degrading the hormone when it's done, but also a way of potentially protecting. Remember I gave the example first day of class? Thyroid hormone controls both the tail resorption in the tadpole and the limb. But if you resorb the tail before you have limbs, then you kind of control it. So the limbs, for example, might be protected by making the reverse T3, allowing the tail to respond even though the hormone is circulating in general at the same time. So and and there, there are probably examples like that in the human <laughs> All right, we're good? So now you have, for thyroid hormone, you have how it's synthesized, how it's released, how it circulates, its degradation. What you don't know about now is receptor binding and action, and that's what the rest of today's lecture is going to be about. So primarily, steroid hormones and vitamin D, which is sort of a steroid, so we'll synthesize it later. And the thyroid hormones work through nuclear hormone receptors that are all related. They're all in the same tube family. Steroid hormones, which we've talked about, glucocorticoids, androgens, estrogens, Progesterone. We will talk about mineralocorticoids, aldosterone. Did I say estrogen? The steroid hormones primarily work through these nuclear hormone receptors, as well as vitamin D and thyroid hormone. There's a fundamental difference between vitamin D and thyroid hormone, how they work, and how the steroid hormone. The steroid hormone receptor, steroid hormone receptor, yeah, and thyroid hormone and vitamin D have several domains. So if I stretch the protein out, I think this would be the amino end. There's a region sort of in the middle that's a DNA binding domain. DNA binding domain. Then there's something called a hinge.
And it's a hormone binding domain. And it's the hormone binding domain that determines what kind of receptor it is. Sorry. <laughs> it's the hormone binding domain that determines whether you call something a glucocorticoid receptor, androgen receptor, estrogen receptor, sort of. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Then there are two transactivational domains. turn genes on or off. Okay. I'll tell you how in a second. But what genes they turn on and off depend on what other factors are present in the cell. That that some of them bind to this area, some of them bind directly to other regions of the promoter in the DNA, okay. for example. Because you don't want to, you know, my tadpole example is my favorite, but with androgens, for example, androgens make you go bald on the top of your head, but they also make your beard grow. So obviously they do very different things depending on whether they're binding to a cell in your face or a cell on the top of your head. So how can you have a hormone that has the same receptor and the same DNA in every cell do something different? And it's because it's different cells express different transcription factors and cofactors that determine what that receptor hormone complex does. And I only know two examples that I can give, but there's probably hundreds of thousands. How can Gary Firestone for one? We gotta get past this and start making babies and growing up and all that stuff. We don't have time to do all that. So here's what happens. I'm going to give you a generic model first. At least when I first learned this stuff, the steroid receptors were drawn this way. So this is how I draw. The DNA binding region is the so-called zinc finger protein. So there are zincs that are complex with cysteines in the main chain of the protein that make these fingers. And these zincs, so they're complex, I think, the four cysteines. That sort of make these fingers. So it, I don't know the chemistry, but it would look like this. You have cysteine, cysteine, cysteine. So the zinc's kind of complex like that to make these fingers. That's the DNA binding domain. And these fingers run along the major groove of the DNA 
and certain genes in their promoter have a sequence that's recognized by a particular zinc finger. Does that make sense? So these zinc fingers run along the major groove of the DNA, and they identify actually these palindromic sequences. You know what palindrome is? Like AT, AT, whatever. It's two things, but you read it forwards and backwards, it says the same thing. Like ba, B O B, ba, 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 it's a palindrome. So the DNA binding region will recognize what are called hormone regulated elements. HREs, hormone regulated elements. And they can turn genes on or off. Hormone regulated elements. They're the promoter of the gene. This is a generic model. I'm going to give you something a little more specific than this. The other region of the receptor is the hormone binding region. We're going to start with cortisol. So this receptor is a cortisol receptor, what's called a GR, GR, glucocorticoid receptor, GR. The glucocorticoid receptor is the glucocorticoid receptor because it binds glucocorticoids, binds cortisol. So the receptor is defined, sort of. You want to know why I keep saying sort of? Because the glucocorticoid binds the aldosterone receptor better than aldosterone. In most cases, that's not true. We'll talk about how that's handled biologically later. But in general, the receptors are defined by what hormone binds to it. And we'll talk about on Tuesday how to figure out what hormone binds to what receptor. Yeah, what's your name? Adam. Adam, what's up? Uh, sorry, I'll go back a bit. But so, they pick your they go to your. What were you saying? The zinc. So, the zinc fingers, the, the, the DNA binding domain. For all, so generically I'm talking now for all steroid receptors, the vitamin D receptor, the vitamin hormone receptor, um, and some other receptors like SF1 that I talked about. The motif is the zinc finger. And, and there are different amino acid sequences that attach to those fingers, if you will, that recognize specific DNA sequences. So the glucocorticoid receptor, I'll give you another word. So the GR. receptor will recognize a sequence called the glucocorticoid response element, or the GRE. The antigen receptor recognizes an ARE. The estrogen receptor recognizes an ERE. Vitamin D receptor recognizes a VRE. It's a hormone response element. It's a specific sequence that's recognized by that particular receptor. Good. Well, it turns out in this family of protein, I, I have to notice if I just read this, there are 48 nuclear hormone receptors in the human genome. Okay, the ones that are relevant, so 48 that work the way, sort of way I'm coming. The ones that are important in this class are the steroid receptors. Glucocorticoid receptor, GR, mineralocorticoid receptor, MR, androgen receptor, AR, the estrogen receptor, ER, progesterone receptor, PR, thyroid hormone receptor, PR, and the vitamin D receptor, ER. Other receptors in this family that we'll talk about include SF1, <laughs> but SF1 is the so-called orphan receptor, so they don't know what the ligand is, so it's a receptor, but nobody knows what binds to it, except this paper that we wrote that we were probably wrong, so don't read that. <laughs> <laughs> then there's a RXR, which we'll talk about today, the, the retinoid X receptor, I don't know what the X is, and, it's, and it does have a ligand, retinoid acid. Yep, with the cortisol bound to it. Yeah, 
Yeah, so, 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 yeah, the way I've drawn this, so the DNA binding domain is the part that recognizes the response element in the DNA, and it's the zinc finger motif. The hormone binding domain is this kind of pocket where the hormone fits in. And here, here's how I like the structures, too. Imagine, you're going to see something else later today, but imagine this receptor knows the difference between cortisol and cortisone. It knows the difference between what proton missing. So it can bind cortisol, but not cortisone. Can't bind it. That's why I like the structure system. Because as you'll see, there's some other crazy stuff to talk about in a minute. So this is the basic model. Can, can we move? What is this? Glucocorticoid response element. So every hormone receptor has a response element. It's a specific sequence. OK, we're good? OK. <coughs> What I'm going to tell you now is true for all the steroid hormone receptors that we've talked about, except estrogen. And, and you know what? This is one of those things that changes every year. I remember when I first learned about steroid hormone receptors, it was probably three years ago, because I'm an old guy. We were originally taught that the steroid receptors went to the cytoplasm, and then they get translocated to the nucleus. And then by the time I was in graduate school, we were taught, no, they're all in the nucleus as an artifact of how they prepare cells. And then, by the time I got to be a professor, I was taught by Gary Firestone and others, well, some of them are in the cytoplasm, and some of them are in the nucleus. So I'm going to tell you now what I know from Wally, you know Wally Wang. So I'm going to tell you now what I know from Wally Wang to be the truth. But if they read something next year that's different, this is not my field of expertise. They, they discover something new every year. So in the cytoplasm, According to Wally Wang, in the cytoplasm, these receptors are in the cytoplasm. Again, this is according to Professor Wally Wang, the latest information that I have. The estrogen receptor is in the nucleus. This is just for steroid receptors. I'm going to tell you something different in a minute. This is just for the steroid hormone. I am a thyroid hormone doing something completely different. So just for the steroid hormone receptors listed on the board right now. Here's how they work. We're good. The estrogen receptor, according to the latest from Wally Wayne, the estrogen receptor is in the nucleus already. That means that the estrogen has to come all the way through the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, the nuclear membrane, and find its receptor in the nucleus. How it does that, I don't know. Some people speculate that they're actually trafficking proteins that actually dock with and carry the steroid to the nucleus, but to my knowledge, nobody's ever discovered one of those. And I've seen some paper, I told some of you guys not about it, that calculate how long it would take this lipophilic molecule to get up across the cytoplasm, and it's like years, so like 15 years, something crazy like that. So people have no idea, one, if you're a lipophilic molecule and you go into the cell membrane, why would you ever leave if you're like in a nice fatty lipid thing? Why would you go back into the water and cytoplasm? Nobody knows. But somehow the estrogen receptor gets from the blood, from its binding protein, all the way across the cell membrane, all the way through the cytoplasm, all the way to the nuclear membrane, and finds its receptor. I don't know how that is, but it does. If it didn't, none of us would be here. Because then you wouldn't have a uterus and stuff. All right, so for these ones, we're talking about the ER in a second. For these ones that are in the cytoplasm, they're complex with other proteins. Okay? So these receptors that are in the cytoplasm, this is the nucleus. Any one of these. They're complex with, associated with, among other things, something called HSP90. Who knows what HSP is? Heat shock. Protein. Heat shock protein. So they're complex with heat shock protein 90 and some other stuff. Don't worry about it.
People yell at me in the past. So anytime I use an abbreviation, I always write it down. So it's a protein that responds to heat shock to a temperature. And I think 90 is the molecular weight or something like that, isn't it? Who knows? Is that true, what I just said? Okay, I declare it to be true. I think that's where the 90 comes from. So this protein inhibits the receptor from going into the nucleus. So this heat shock protein inhibits the receptor from going into the nucleus. In addition, are we good? Am I going too fast? Okay. Yeah. You're going too fast. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to stop me. You think it's bad. You wait a week from now. So it turns out that the hormone binding region inhibits the DNA binding region. Say that again. The hormone binding region inhibits the DNA binding region for these receptors we're talking about now. When the ligand comes along, in this case, let's say cortisol, the ligand removes the inhibition. It causes a conformational change. So that now the DNA binding region can interact with DNA. So when cortisol comes along, let's use cortisol for now. But this is true for all of these hormones. One, the conformational change <coughs> causes the HSP90 to disengage from the receptor. And this is presumably true for all the steroid receptors that are up there now. Although when I was in my first endocrinology class in grad school, it was only true for glucocorticoids. Now it's apparently true for all of these. So the cortisol binds, it causes the HSP90 to disengage. That allows now the receptor to translocate into the nucleus. This is true for all the ones that are written on the board. The cortisol receptor, with the cortisol bound in, binds as a homodimer so that means that there are two GREs in that promoter it binds as a homodimer and this is true for all those hormones that are written on the board yes I'll repeat the whole thing that's my job. You get a paycheck every month doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, all those receptors that are on the board right now are present in the cytoplasm in the abdomen. And they're present in the cytoplasm complex with HSP90 and other stuff. You don't need to worry about that. You get fire sometimes. They're complex with HSP90, which keeps them in the cytoplasm. So they can't turn genes on or off. The cortisol causes a conformational change. You gotta love that word, don't you? You don't know what it means. It, it unfolds, it folds in a different way. The cortisol causes a conformational change that allows, induces the HSP90 to move away. So now the receptor can go into the nucleus. Once in the, in the nucleus, it runs along the major groove of the DNA until it finds GREs, and they bind as a homodimer along with other transcription factors. So there might be like 100 other proteins piled up on there. I don't know what they are, and we'll have time to talk about them, but they're there. So there's other transcription factors, there's other cofactors, because again, you don't turn on the same genes in every part of the tissue. Different things happen in the tissue, but it all happens through the mechanism. We're good. Question? Okay. The only thing different for the estrogen receptor, I'll give you a second to draw this again. I'll draw it over for yourself. Is the estrogen receptors already in the nucleus? 
So the estrogen has the estradiol has to come in and get all the way in there. The estrogen receptor is already in the nucleus, potentially already bound to the DRE, but it can't activate it until the estrogen binds. The estrogen receptor is already in the nucleus. In fact, I take that back. It's probably not bound to the DNA. Because the hormone binding domain is inhibiting it, and when the estrogen finds it in the nucleus, then it's allowed to interact with the DNA and regulate transcription. Again, there's a whole bunch of, right, there's RNA polymerase, there's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. Yeah? So it doesn't have the... Sharon? It doesn't have the HSP9B no. inhibiting it. So what is it inhibiting it from? The estrogen, the hormone binding domain inhibits the DNA binding domain. Otherwise, the receptor will be active all the time. So the ligand has to get in there, bind to its and some other stuff have to do with what I Bind to the hormone binding to make, then get the DNA interaction and transfer it to the other And for the rest of them, they have that dual. For the rest of them, they're on the side of them. They can't do anything. They can't find the DNA until the hormones are. As of Wally went to like the last year. Ooh, yeah. Wait, are you happy? No, you're watching me. Great. Great. We're happy. Okay. So, with, for the other. No, this one binds to HSP90. So all those other receptors are complex with HSP90 as well. And they're in the cytoplasm. When the hormone, when the ligand gets in, they release HSP90 and go into the nucleus. But for an antigen receptor, it's an antigen. For the estrogen, or for the progesterone receptor, it's a progesterone. Progesterone, I think, is the only progesterone that goes back in. So the hormone binding site still I can do all Yes, for all the ones we talked about so far. In fact, for all the ones that we're going to talk about today, for you. Yes, and this is what's called type one. You need to get one more step. I'm going to show you type two. I think there are five types. You only need to know the two of them. Yep. I think they're both. I think they're the Vitamin D, which is not a vitamin or a hormone, we'll talk about that later, and to the thyroid hormone. In fact, there are two thyroid hormone receptors called TR alpha and beta. I should say there are at least two estrogen receptors as well, ER alpha and ER beta. There are two thyroid hormone receptors, thyroid hormone, TR alpha and TR beta. The thyroid hormone and vitamin D3 receptors are in the nucleus. They're bound to the DNA. Oops, I should say TR. Don't find it yet. They're bound to the DNA, but they're com coupled. Maybe that's the word I was trying to think of. They're coupled with an inhibitor so that they can't regulate the genes. So this is your thyroid hormone receptor. They're coupled with some inhibitor. It does not act as a homodimer. It acts as a heterodimer with something called RXR, also in the same family.
RXR stands for retinoid X receptor. I don't know what the X stands for. Maybe it's middle name of Malcolm, I don't know. RXR <laughs> retinoid X receptor. And it forms a heterodimer with both the vitamin D receptor and the thyroid hormone receptor. Am I going to fix? Oh, why don't you guys say something then? I'm going at just the right speed for me. Wait. Yeah, what's up? What's the, uh, the, the writing on the inhibitor? It says inhibitor. <laughs> I am inhibitor. <laughs> 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 I, I, there, there might be specific proteins, I don't know. Okay. Wally, Wally Wang is called an inhibitor, not an inhibitor. So what thyroid hormone would do in this case is when it binds to its receptor, the inhibitor is removed and RNA polymerase can sit down and start transcribing those genes that have 